I can't get into the crossover process until we talk a little bit about uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan. And he's in the early 1900s working at Columbia University. And Morgan is pretty confident when he starts his work that Mendel is wrong. And he even has some doubts about evolution. And he certainly doesn't believe that chromosomes are the source of uh, the traits that get passed on. So, so what Morgan is doing and, and what won him and uh, a couple other guys in his laboratory, Nobel Prizes, is the fact that they, they discover pretty conclusively that chromosomes are the source of these traits. And not only do they say what uh, the chromosomes are, but they verify uh, what Mendel uh, had already discovered. And they do it with uh, fruit flies, uh, Drosophila. And Drosophila was chosen because of its reproductive, quick reproduction. Only takes a couple of weeks uh, for a fruit fly uh, to uh, fertilize, uh, be fertilized, and then uh, have eggs which hatch and uh, produce offspring. So uh, quickly, uh, then uh, Morgan could look at the results of uh, crossbreeding. It wasn't. A, it was a slow process for Mendel. He had to. He had to cross them and then grow new plants every time. So Morgan, uh, Morgan speeds up the process by uh, using flies. Uh, and I, I, th I think I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a, a little bit about the specific variations that he gets. Uh, we can see them in this particular diagram. Let me just label some of these. Uh, there are brown eyes with black body, cinnabar eyes, a sepia eyes with an ebony body, vermilion eyes, white eyes, and you also get wild type eyes with yellow body. And we're going to refer to wild type uh, frequently. Wild type is simply uh, the characteristic that occurs in the wild if we know it. And uh, that's all that wild type means. Let's talk now about specifically what Morgan does. First of all, he realizes that the X chrome, uh, the Y chromosome in males is smaller than the X chromosome. Now you know uh, that females have two X chromosomes and uh, males have a Y chromosome and an X chromosome. And here's a picture of the uh, real uh, X and Y chromosomes. And uh, you can see in the flies here uh, that you've got um, in the female fly uh, you have red, with red eyes. Uh, you've got two X chromosomes, and then in the male fly, you've got the X chromosome and right Y chromosome. Now, what Morgan did was he discovered a white-eyed fly, a male fly. Uh, and as the story goes, the, the fly was on its deathbed almost, and he very carefully puts it in with the female, and I think the last thing the fly did was mate and then die. But he got his white-eyed uh, trait passed on. These traits were very hard for Morgan to discover at first and to recognize. And they'd have to go through thousands of flies to find a trait. We'll talk more about how these traits are generated, uh, but it, uh, it was not easy in the early going to, uh, to get and find these traits. So that's why it was so important to Morgan to get this white-eyed fly to pass on its trait. Well, what happens here, and we've seen this already with Mendel, so I won't go into much detail, but he takes uh, the female red-eyed fly. Now, that fly has two X chromosomes, each with a red-eyed uh, trait, which is uh, dominant. And then he's got a male with a X chromosome, which has the recessive white-eyed trait on it, and a Y chromosome, which has no trait on it related to flies. That's important. So when you, when you pass this on, you're going to get you're going to get females with uh, a red eye, 50%, and you're going to get a red-eyed uh, male, 50%, and uh, that red-eyed male is also going to have a Y chromosome with no trait on, whereas the X chromosome in the female, they're going to have a red uh, 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 dominant and a uh, chromosome with X chromosome with white recessive on it. So the eyes are actually going to be red. So he's got two red eyes. Now, he's going to cross those results and just what Mendel did, he's going to, as you can see down here, he's going to cross them. He's going to cross them and he's 
taking the female, uh, which is here on the uh, left side, uh, with the white chromosome, X chromosome, and a red chromosome, and it's going to mix with a male with a red chromosome, X chromosome, and a Y with no uh, trait. And you get then a red female uh, up here at the top. You get a male with red eyes. You get then a female with red eyes down at the bottom, but you get a male with white eyes. Precisely what Mendel got, which is what convinces Morgan that Mendel was right. 75% of the flies have red eyes, 25% has white eyes. So, so far he's verified uh, pretty much uh, what, uh, what Mendel got. Now, here's what is really unique about Morgan and one of the great things that Morgan discovered. What he starts to do is he starts to look at uh, multiple traits. So, he wants to look at how two traits behave. And so, in this particular case, I, I'll show you, we're going to use uh, body color and, and wing uh, uh, structures. In the body color, it'll be wild type as the dominant and uh, black body as the recessive. And then in the wing, it'll be a wild type and a vestigial uh, type. Uh, the vestigial is kind of a stubby wing. And the, the female is going to have a dominant uh, uh, body color with a recessive black gene. And the male is going to have uh, two recessive genes. The wing type is going to be pretty much the same. The, the female is going to have a uh, dominant wild type with a recessive vestigial type. Male uh, is going to have vestigial vestigial. And when you mix those, what Morgan got, and, and this will, will show up to be kind of an astonishing result in, in just a minute, he got 965 with uh, uh, dominant wild body and dominant wild wing. He got 944 with black body recessive and uh, vestigial wing which is recessive. He got 206 though with a wild body but a vestigial wing and he got 185 with a black body and a wild uh, wing. So there's some mixing going on. Now if, if the uh, traits are on a single chromosome, if both traits are on a single chromosome, then you would expect to get a ratio of one to one and you would get only uh, wild types uh, in the first case and the recessive traits. Uh, so instead of getting 965 and 944 with the 206 and 185, it, it should be a total of the first two in a 50-50 ratio, or a one-to-one uh, one one ratio, better way to say it. If you have them on different chromosomes, though, as I've shown down here, you should have a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio. So in, in either case, you can see Morgan's not getting the result that he expects. So he's got to explain this. Nobody understands it. You shouldn't be getting any uh, of the uh, uh, wild uh, body and vestigial wing or the black body with wild wing. You should be uh, getting, uh, if they're on the same chromosome. Uh, but he does get some, but he doesn't get it in the ratio that he should expect if they were on separate chromosomes, which would be one to one to one to one. I hope that's clear. So uh, that gives us then an opportunity to talk a little bit about Sturdivant. Sturdivant was a junior in college at Columbia University working in Morgan's lab. And Sturdivant, uh, first I have to tell you that these guys, uh, Morgan and, and, and his co-workers, uh, they were so obsessed with getting results uh, that they really didn't have time to give the results a lot of thought. And uh, Sturdivant had a little extra time apparently on his hands. So he goes to Morgan and he says, look, he said, I got a hunch on something here. He said, I, could I take the data home and, and take a look at it and, uh, and see if I can figure out some things. Well, you know, what's Morgan got to lose? Uh, he says, sure, take the data, uh, let us know what you, what you figure out. Well, Sturdivant uh, 
is a, a, an exceptionally bright guy, and he has he has a hypothesis. He's kind of got a, an idea about uh, what might be happening here. It turns out that the number of those uh, uh, ones on the right, the ones that were in, in low concentrations, uh, they turned out to be 17% um, in the total number generated. Uh, so 17% uh, were uh, of the vestigial and black body uh, recessive traits that they, they thought they shouldn't get if the chromosomes were on the same, or I should say the traits were on the same chromosome. And what Sturdivant thinks is happening, and he, and he can see this, he sees that these chromosomes are crossing over one another uh, during the process of mitosis. And he suspects that maybe during this crossover that sometimes uh, the, the chromosomes recombine. Well, one breaks and attaches to another one. And if he's right, that means that uh, not all the time, but some of the times, you'll get traits moving from one chromosome to another. And so he suspects that the reason why he's getting this 17% is that the distance on the chromosome between the black body recessive and the vestigial recessive is 17%. He just makes that as a hypothesis. He says that because the distance between those two is 17%, that they will only cross over and break there at 17% of the time. The rest of the time, even if they break, they'll go over and it won't affect the results. So how do you test something like this? Well, Sturdivant has some other data. He has a cinnabar eye. And so he can take the cinnabar eye and he can see how the cinnabar eye fits into the picture. Well, if he mixes the cinnabar and the vestigial wing with each other, he gets uh, these recessive, cinnabar, and vestigial showing up 8% of the time. And so what he thinks is, is that cinnabar is either to the right of the vestigial by 8%, or to the left of the vestigial by 8%. Now, if it's to the right, then the black body should be 25% away. If it's to the left, then the black body uh, should be 8% minus 17, or 9% um, uh, cinnabar, that is, should be 9% to the right of black body, or 8% to the left of vestigial. And I'll, I'll show you the diagram in just a minute. So, so what he does is, in order to test this, is he uh, mixes cinnabar with black body. And the results are uh, given here. Look at this, how sweet this worked out. It turns out that cinnabar is 8% away from the vestigial wing. That means it's 9% away from the black body, which is the result he got. So he could then make a prediction and uh, test it, and it tested out just the way he thought it was. Uh, this was very good evidence that he was right. So he, he runs and he tells Morgan this, and of course Morgan's uh, going crazy over this result because it's so exciting. Uh, so Sturdivant's uh, idea uh, seems to be correct. Now, now, let me tell you the significance of this and why I'm spending so much time explaining it. Well, well this basically means that we know, or, or I should say the Hunt team knew where these traits were on the chromosomes. You could actually identify which chromosome was carrying which trait, and not only which chromosome, but where on that chromosome relative to one another they all existed. So Sturdivant has created what we call the first linkage map. He has evidence then that this process of crossover is actually happening. And of course it was supported by further work. And I want to show you this top diagram. It's just showing you uh, some of the characteristics. And then when you have crossover and they reconnect, you can see how the colors uh, vary. Uh, you, you get the recombinants on the bottom. And you can see then how uh, the colors vary where they, they reconnected during the crossover process and then how uh, you would get uh, different recessive genes uh, crossing over. And the farther they were located from one another, the more often they would cross over and the, and the higher the results. 
And that's where the 17% or the 8% or the 9% came from. So this was a brilliant uh, discovery. And uh, take you back to that my mitosis then, uh, I mentioned that those color variations were uh, the reason that, that, or a crossover was the reason for those color variations in the final product of mitosis then, when the sperm or the egg are being created, you get, uh, you get an immense diversity because of this crossover, which is really uh, quite astonishing. And this is a map. Uh, they worked further and they could link all of these different characteristics, not only to a chromosome, but they could tell where uh, each characteristic was relative uh, to, uh, to the other uh, traits. How cool is that? Uh, I mean, science is, uh, is wonderful when uh, it's, it's done in, in this way. So Sturdivant discovers crossovers. Uh, the Hunt team goes on uh, to great fame. And, uh, and this leads the way uh, to, of course, focusing on the chromosomes as the source of these traits. So the Morgan team has done great things um, in, the, in the early uh, 1900s. Uh, they've gotten everybody to focus on the chromosomes as uh, really where the secrets uh, of life are contained. I want to take some time to talk about Hermann Mueller. Uh, he, Mueller worked in the Hunt lab for a time, and then he got a job at the University of Texas. And what Mueller was interested in was, I, I mentioned to you how difficult it was to find um, these traits that were different. And the reason for that was that you didn't have mutations very often. And uh, uh, Mueller suspected that these were mutations taking place. Well, he didn't suspect. He knew they were mutations. But he wanted to know why these mutations were occurring. And he suspected that if he uh, hammered these flies with x-rays, uh, that uh, he could produce mutations. And that's exactly what he did. At first, uh, he uh, hit them with x-rays and killed them all off. But he found that if he lowered the dose and uh, zapped them, uh, that he would get mutations. And not only that, uh, he found that the amount of the dosage was equal to the number of mutations that he got. So, so what has Mueller done here? Well, he's, he's really discovered uh, why we have uh, these mutations. It's, a, uh, it's an environmental uh, situation. It didn't, didn't take um, Mueller uh, any uh, difficulty to assume that that mutations occur in nature because of a potentially at least some uh, to radiation from the sun because uh, we're bombarded by small amounts of radiation that can harm our genes uh, or create mutations in our genes. That's why it was taking Morgan so long to find these uh, trait variations because uh, it, yeah, they had to wait, they had to find a fly that was affected by uh, by radiation. Whereas uh, Mueller then could create all, all the mutations you want. I mean, he, he had flies where, where, where the uh, legs would be attached to, to, to the head. So all kinds of strange things happening in, in Mueller's lab. And he won the Nobel Prize for this work because he finds out how uh, you get mutations. A lot of uh, really cool discoveries uh, related to uh, the Morgan uh, Laboratory. Well, let me, uh, let me talk about the, this fellow for a, a time. Um, his name is Frederick Griffith. Now, uh, again, I want to set the stage for what's happening. In, in 1917, World War I was taking place, and the United States got involved in, in World War I about that time. And the, uh, the Doughboys here in the United States shipped over uh, to, uh, to the, the European theater. And... Uh, at that time, the Spanish flu broke out. Uh, the Spanish flu was called the Spanish flu because uh, they had a lot of cases breaking out in Spain, but it was actually traced back to Kansas as the source. There were, um, there were troops stationed in Kansas, and, and uh, they carried the flu over to Europe. 
the flu was so bad that it literally caused World War I to shut down for a while in the trenches in Europe. There were so many people uh, sick from the flu, they couldn't even fight a war. So, pretty serious pandemic. That pandemic uh, is estimated to have killed between 50 and 100 million people, an astonishing number. And one of the reasons it was so lethal is because oftentimes it was combined with pneumonia. So people would come down with a, a strain of a pneumonia. And what, what got Griffith then interested in this particular work was uh, really what, would, what had happened in World War I. And so in 1928, he starts working with a pneumonia coccus, or uh, it's actually a stre streptococcus uh, pneumoniae. And uh, you can see in this diagram uh, what he did. Uh, he's got a rough strain. He, he, uh, he sees underneath the microscope that it, it looks uh, like a, a rough surface to him. And he finds that this rough surface strain is non virulent. In other words, he injects a mouse with it. The mouse lives, doesn't die of pneumonia. He's got a smooth strain, though, which is, which is virulent. And if he injects this into a mouse, this smooth strain will kill the mouse. Well, the next thing he does is he heats up uh, the smooth strain, which is virulent, remember, and he kills the bacteria by heating it up. So when he injects it in the mouse, the mouse doesn't die of pneumonia. But what happens in the next step is he mixes the heated smooth strain, which should be dead, and the rough strain. Both of them at this point are non-virulent. He injects it in the mouse and the mouse dies. So this is a case where uh, he's getting something that he would predict shouldn't happen. And this is an exciting time. Scientists look for these kinds of situations. We, we're trying to find cases that don't match so we can make discoveries. And in this case, Griffith is, is convinced that he's onto something here. Something is making that rough strain turn into a virulent strain, uh, the smooth strain. And he's able to culture it from the dead mouse and uh, find out that it's, it's a, a smooth virulent live strain. So, so something is happening to convert the rough strain to a, a smooth strain that's a killer. So he then starts working on this and he's able to get this to happen in the laboratory. He doesn't have to go through the mice. And he realizes that uh, that it's related to, uh, to genetics. Uh, he calls it an S-transform. Uh, and one of the sad things is, is that in 1941, of course, World War II had started, and uh, the Germans were bombing London extensively, and Griffith was in London, his laboratory was in London, and uh, he was working in his lab one night, and there was an air raid, uh, and uh, so uh, rather than run to the local shelter, he stayed in his laboratory. The laboratory was bombed, and he died, so he didn't get uh, to find out uh, how, uh, how this was happening or what was causing this. But his work was picked up, and unfortunately I can't go into all the details here, but his work was picked up by a man named Oswald Avery, uh, and, and Oswald Avery uh, looked at uh, these s transform. Uh, strains, and he found that they were made up of proteins, lipids, polysaccharides, RNA, and DNA. And then he's able to, through an, a series of experiments, he's able to decide that DNA is the cause, is, is the source of the cause of this transform. So now we know uh, not only that these traits are carried in uh, the chromosomes, but we know now what is causing uh, the coding system uh, because of Oswald Avery's work. We know it's in the DNA. So really Oswald Avery starts uh, people looking for the coding system in DNA. And the first thing everybody does is run out and uh, analyze uh, what DNA is to figure out what might be the coding. And here is a, a DNA, the composition of it. It's a phosphate deoxyribose backbone. You probably all heard this in biology in high school, somewhere along the line. Uh, 
uh, and it's got uh, four bases, the, the purines, which are adenine and thymine, and then you have the, the pyridines, which are guanine and, and cytosine. So you've got these four bases. You've got this, uh, this phosphate deoxyribo, uh, it's a five uh, sugar, uh, uh, and a five carbon sugar, I should say. And uh, yet everybody's scratching their head going, hey, uh, how could this be a coating? Uh, it seems like a rather simple molecule in terms of its ability to code. So what's it going to take to figure out uh, what's going on with DNA? Well, what it's going to take is it's going to take uh, finding out the structure of the DNA 